Hello and welcome to A Novel Idea, an event as part of Open Books. My name is Bethany Rutter and I'm the author of three novels, including No Big Deal and Melt My Heart for Young People. Um, today, I'm delighted to be hosting a conversation with five very talented people from the book industry. Before we get started, let me just tell you a quick little bit about Open Books. Open Books will be bringing you an exciting selection of online events and short videos introducing you to careers in the book industry. It will show you how you could put your interests, passions, and creative skills to work, whether it be art and design, business acumen, or worldwide travel and languages. We'll also be diving deeper into some of the jobs in the book industry you might already know about, such as working as an editor or in areas like marketing and publicity. This panel, A Novel Idea, is all about words and stories. Whether it's working as an editor or as a literary agent, the book industry needs people who can find great stories and writing talent and bring us brilliant books that we love. So what do these roles entail? Do you need an eagle eye for spelling mistakes, the ability to build great relationships with creative people, or is it simply about being passionate about books? Let's talk to our panel and find out. I'm joined today by five people who know all about working in the book industry as editors and literary agents. I'm going to start by asking them each to introduce themselves. Um, let's start with Juliet. Hi, I'm Juliet. I'm an agent at Blake Friedman Literary Agency. Um, I represent a really mixed list of fiction and non-fiction authors, often writing contemporary stories um, so there's a bit of memoir, a bit of cookery, lots of fiction from very literary through to romantic and more commercial books. Um, and that's me. Hi, I'm Marie Harper. Um, I'm editorial director at Bluebird in One Boat, which are imprints of Pan Macmillan, which is one of the big five publishers in the UK. Um, and at Bluebird, we publish books that make the world more tolerant, informed, compassionate and delicious. That's across illustrated cookery books, researched investigative reporting and high, highly uh, personal memoir. And the thread at Bluebird that ties all of our books together is this idea of joy, meaning and purpose. And at One Boat, we publish books that help readers protect the planet. So we publish everybody from Ugandan climate activist Vanessa Nakate to um, Hull grandmother and Bake Off winner Nancy Burtwistle. Hello, uh, my name is Moira Fees and I'm the commissioning editor at Guardian Faber, which is an imprint at Faber and Faber. Uh, Guardian Faber is basically a partnership between Faber the Publishing House and the Guardian newspaper. And I'm the first point of contact for Guardian journalists who are thinking about uh, writing a book. And I help them develop their ideas on investigative journalism, current affairs, sports, culture, you name it. Um, and I also work on some of uh, Faber's general non-fiction list, which includes uh, musical pop culture and general politics as well. Hi, I'm Soleil, I'm an agent, and I represent a mixed list um, of authors, journalists, content creators, and people who are writing books for everyone. I think my books uh, on my list that I represent all they're quite commercial but they're also a little bit weird and um, I love that because it means that people who don't always see themselves as readers or people who are think maybe they're not a bookish person can find something on my list. Hi there uh, I'm Ben Horslin I'm fiction publisher at Penguin Random House Children's so I publish books for young people from sort of the age of six or so up to, to teen to YA um and uh some of the authors who i work with who you might have heard of down at the younger end uh, jeremy strong who's been writing fabulous funny books for for younger kids for many years um through to um lee newbury whose uh, book the last firefox did really well for us last year and then up at the older end of of ya i published um, ransom riggs um, and john green Thank you so much. So we'll kick off some questions. Um, this is for Soleil and Juliet as agents. Um, could you begin by telling us what literary agents do? So primarily we are like the first contact between author and publisher. And so we take on a writer, it might be that they've sent us their book on submission. So we receive lots of kind of books into our inbox every day. And that might be novels, full books, or it might be proposals. So ideas for nonfiction. And um, once we decide to sign that writer, we have a conversation about editorial work. So we might help them shape their novel that might be story or character or theme 
Um, and on nonfiction side, we help kind of sharpen up their pitch for their nonfiction idea. So there's a lot of editorial work involved, and that will go on for like 99% of my authors at least throughout their career. I'll often be the first person to read their books or their ideas. And then we also take those books to a publisher and or a variety of publishers and look to find that book a publishing home. So we are essentially sort of sending the book out to lots of publishers, trying to make sure that editors are coming back to us and are interested. And then we are negotiating a book deal for that book and that author. And as the agent, we do a lot of negotiation. So something I didn't really know before I joined the industry was how much negotiation you need to do, how much of a kind of salesperson you have to be sometimes. But I didn't consider that I had any of those skills before I came in the industry. I'm not sure that I consider I have them that well now. I hope I do. Um, but it's something that I've learned along the way. So I, I would say for those people who don't feel confident with that sort of thing, don't worry too much about it. An agent is, you know, the author's champion in the book industry, essentially. And the idea is that we're there for an entire author's career and not just for the one book. Uh, so that's a small snapshot of what we do. But Sile might have lots more to add to that. Yeah. What do you think, Sile? I mean, probably if we had hours and hours, I could add more. But that's a pretty comprehensive view of what an agent does. Um, I think I would, I would say I became an agent because I was obsessed with office culture when I was younger. I was so wrong to be obsessed with office culture, but I always wanted to be that person like wearing heels and a suit and kind of strolling down big glass uh, buildings, you know, the like corridors walking past people's desks, like kind of think Miranda Priestley or um, Sandra Bullock from The Proposal sort of vibes. And but I always love books and reading. So I went, hmm, what can I do where, you know, books is not as glamorous and as businessy as all of my favourite TV shows growing up, um, but I want to do that when I'm an adult. And I think being an agent is that sort of combination. We might not wear suits, I'm mostly dressed like this. It's one of my favourite jumpers that I get to wear a lot of the time to work, but I do get to be closest to the business end of publishing, which is really, really fun um, because the book industry has so many different parts to it, but the publishing part of it can often be quite, romanticized let's say and you or a lot of times people will think you just sit and read books all day or you just kind of come up with an idea and then you kind of float around for a little bit and it's a book on the shelves and there's so much more than that and agenting is really the business end where I was terrible at maths at school but now I do a lot of maths a lot of numbers a lot of spreadsheets but I also do a lot of strategy like Juliet was saying I do a lot of calls with authors and editors, sometimes negotiating money up, sometimes negotiating an author off the ledge when they've had a moment that they feel they can't get past in their manuscript or um, whatever else they're writing. So it's so varied, which is really nice, but it definitely is kind of towards the more um, business focused, numbers focused. It does a lot of balancing books and budgets and being aware of money in a way that you don't have to be in every single part of the book industry. Thank you. Um, so this is for Ben Murray and Mo. Could you tell us about what editors do, please? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so I'm slightly different to Ben in that Ben works in children's, I work in adults. Mo, I don't know if we might have a little bit of crossover, but um, in my job, I essentially have to buy non-fiction books that I think will sit well on the Bluebird list. So I talk to agents like Juliet and Sile, or I might reach out to people that I follow on Instagram or on Twitter or anyone I've seen who I think might have a great idea that they could bring forward in a book. Um, so I have conversations with agents about their clients or I reach out to people um, that I'm just interested in. And then I receive what's called a proposal. And a proposal is basically a document that gives me an idea of who the person is, what their idea is for a book and a little bit of a taste of it. So what structure it might take and maybe a sample of their writing as well to get an idea of their tone, their voice, their style. And then once I've received this proposal, I take it forward to my team at Bluebird and that involves talking to people in our communications team. So publicity and marketing sales teams and that includes sales in the UK and internationally and our rights teams who basically talk to other publishers in other countries to see if there might be potential for the book there 
And then, yeah, I kind of essentially pitch that book. I act as a cheerleader for it. And I'm the kind of first port of call internally to promote the book and try to get people behind it. And then if that book turns out to be positively received, I take it forward. As an editor, I put um, an offer down, as Juliet said, that will be in advance. And there's also a long contract which talks all about royalties and lots of numbers things. Um, and if that's successfully received, I become the editor and I essentially um, manage that process from turning that proposal into a fully fledged book. And that can take anywhere between 12 to 18 months. Um, I kind of start off by having a conversation with the author about the shape we want it to take. We talk about the writing style um, and then they kind of go away, start writing it. I'm involved however much they want me to be. We edit it together. I look at, you know, if if the messaging is coming across clear, you know, if the writing needs to be stronger, any other elements that might be important. Um, and then I take it through lots of different editorial processes. So there are people who do kind of more in-depth edits. Those are called copy editors. I then take it to um, my production team who will typeset it. So that involves basically styling it as a book would look because it's originally kind of just words in a Word document. So styling it, designing it um, and moving it forward to the point where it will be published and in stores. So essentially an editor is a, a port of call for that author to bring the book in, to cheerlead it, to promote it, to try and get everybody behind it and then to turn it into a fully fledged book um, at the end. Thank you. Uh, Mo and Ben, is there anything that you you feel is unique to your line of editing that you'd like to chat about? Uh, yeah, I can go. Um, so often I work with um, a lot of journalists at The Guardian, obviously, and they come to me with like uh, very kind of broad ideas. So my role kind of uh, mixes uh, slightly both worlds of agenting and uh, editorial in the sense that uh, people within The Guardian know that they can come to me with ideas and I'll help them talk through what I feel could work for them, uh, what I feel are the strengths and uh, potential gaps in, in their ideas. And they'll keep coming back to me after a couple of months with kind of broader and broader plans until they feel confident with a proposal that they can give to me, after which uh, I'll evaluate it, like Marais said as well. Um, and I guess kind of more granular things that editors do, uh, they can draft kind of um, the copy that appears on a book. So all, all the kind of uh, text that you see on a book, on a finished book, we end up drafting that. Uh, some editors work with a design team uh, to brief kind of the covers as well. Um, and we also work kind of behind the scenes on um, kind of online copy and kind of these kind of secret metadata, uh, which kind of tells uh, direct readers to kind of certain books on search engines like Google or on Amazon and things like that. Um, so it's quite a wide ranging role. I think it always keeps you on your toes. I think every day that you kind of come in, you can kind of be thrown in a lot of different directions. But I think that's kind of is the fun part of it in a way. And if, you kind of, if you're kind of looking for a, uh, for a job or working in a um, something that kind of keeps you on your toes like that, I would definitely recommend it. Ben, would you say there's anything specific to children's publishing that we haven't covered? Um, I don't know necessarily specific to children's, but I think maybe a difference between my role and Mo's and Mireille's is that um, because I publish almost exclusively fiction, um, we do publish non-fiction in our team, but mostly other editors who are more specialised do that. I guess, particularly when I'm working with new authors, um, I will be dealing with a whole book that's been written and finished. Um, that's normally what will cross my desk first. Um, so uh, unlike uh, a non-fiction editor who might have to shape a proposal um, from a very, very early stage, usually I'll be working a little bit further down the line. So I'll have a book, which is, is often great. So you've got all the chapters there, all the writing. Um, and so my role then is perhaps more shaping that um, uh, in that form, uh, which is which is I think that's I would say that probably is the same for adult fiction editors too. It's not that's not exclusive to children's. Um, and then later on, if you once you've got a relationship with an author, once you've um, maybe published one, uh, one or two of their books, at that stage when you're then looking forward to the next project, they might not have to write the whole thing for you. You might then they then might write, okay, what I want to do now is write this amazing book about this boy who flies off on the back of a dragon um, to India and has an adventure there. And you're like, yes, amazing. That sounds sounds incredible. Um, so I think the, the the relationship develops a bit like that. But I think um, 
both Mo and Mireille have, have really sort of nailed down that that sort of the sort of the two ways that an editor's job works. Sort of you have one face sort of out to the world, um, to agents and to sort of people that you 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 know or you may see um, or meet through through social media or whatever. And then in-house where we often talk about it as sort of an editor sits like at the, the hub of a wheel um, and it's an editor's job to talk to all the other departments. Um, so whether that's sales who are actually out there selling the book to, to retailers, marketing and publicity who are trying to make um, people aware of it, rights you might be trying to sell um, the, the translation rights so the book can be published in other languages. The editor always has sort of a dialogue with all of them. So it's fascinating. It means it's particularly fascinating because you are always plugged into sort of whatever's going on with your book and your, your authors across the whole business. Um, but yeah, it can be means you can be spinning quite a lot of plates. So to what Ben just said, um, being an editor involves so much and so does being an agent and I'm just really aware that our audience is likely to still be in school, college or other formal education paths and I remember so keenly that feeling of watching these types of things and people talking about what they do and it sounding incredible and then this pressure of needing to know what you want to do and what I was like I need to know what my life is going to look like. And so I just wanted to say that after all of us spoke, um, a lot of editors become agents and a lot of agents become editors. A lot of children's editors become adult editors. Adult editors become children's fiction, become nonfiction. And so even when you are established in your career and you've been doing something for a long time, you can still change your mind. And a lot of the skills across the book industry lend themselves to each other. We're probably going to touch on it later. Um, and I know that the next question that we're all going to answer is is kind of around this anyway. But I I did want to say it it can feel watching people who've been doing things for a long time and and are very used to talking about their job can be really intimidating. But it, nobody started their career going I know exactly what I want to do and I'm going to keep doing it for the rest of my life. It's highly likely that as we talk more about how we became editors and agents we fell into it we thought we'd do one thing ended up doing another um and now are in a position where we've got all of these skills and contacts so i just wanted to say that now because i don't want anyone to watch this and feel how i used to feel no thank you so much um so yeah the next question was about how you got to where you are now. So I would love to know from all of you, whether you always wanted to be an agent or an editor, or um, if this was something that you fell into and what your path has been to your current role. Um, so maybe we can start with Julia again, as we started before. Yeah, sure. Um, so I had no idea that a literary agent was a thing <laughs> or, like a really long time so I was at university I was doing drama and English I had a weekend job at Waterstones and then when I finished my degree I still had no clue what I wanted to do except it wasn't drama <laughs> and um I sort of thought maybe I'd be a teacher but that really didn't appeal I'd done like two days work experience when I was 16 and was just exhausted by teaching I was like no nah, this is not for me apart from the holidays that bit appealed um and I worked for Woodstones, and one of my colleagues there, and um, so another bookseller, ha uh, had an agent and was a writer. And I was kind of selling books every single day, and I had no idea that agents were any part of the process of getting those books into the shops. Um, so I actually just met his agent at a gig in Shepherd's Bush, and that was when I was first introduced to the idea of an agent being a person involved with authors and with publishing books. And um, and I went and I took two weeks holiday from Waterstones and went and just sat in this agent's office while she was on holiday and kind of did loose, what was loosely termed work experience. But I think it was just me kind of sitting in on the sly, <laughs> not really very officially and reading her submissions, looking at author contracts. And um, she had some incredible authors and still does. Um, and it was a really good foundation in getting some insight into what an agent did. And I love the idea that you were first in there on the ground with the author 
often authors haven't shown anybody else their book when they come to you and I love I feel it's such a privilege to be the first person to read a novel or see an idea um so I did that ready to work experience and then I just wrote to every single agency <laughs> I could find in the writers and artists yearbook and sent a letter and my cv um this was in the days uh of kind of emerging email I am quite old so I think you know nowadays I would have just emailed everyone um, but one of the agencies saw that CV, saw I'd done a bit of work experience and called me and asked me to interview for a, just a general assistant. So that's where I began as an assistant to, again, a kind of agency of about 20 people. And I was really lucky because I started an agency that represented authors like Zadie Smith, um, Philip Pullman, John Ronson, Quentin Blake. So I just had one of the best beginnings um I think and I kind of you just learn on the job from that point onwards so you get to do everything you get to do all the boring stuff like scanning and answering the phone and filing contracts but you also read submissions which is so brilliant and fascinating sometimes quite agonizing but often brilliant um and yeah I've got a real general oversight before then becoming assistant to one agent in particular um, doing that for a couple of years and then being promoted to associate agent, which meant that I could start building my own list of authors. Um, and then you kind of go from there. It's a fairly traditional path through agenting, but it does vary a bit agency to agency. Um, so you go from there when you start finding your own authors on to building up a much bigger list. So I represent about 50 authors now. So I'll let um, someone else answer a question because I could go on for hours on that. <laughs> So how about, we'll have a, an editor now, how about you Mo? What was your pathway and how did you think about your publishing future before you knew? Sure. Yeah, um, I mean after university I had I had no idea what I wanted to do. I um, I studied international relations and so not directly linked to um, publishing uh, necessarily and publishing definitely wasn't on my radar. For some reason anytime I went into a bookstore and looked at a book it didn't click to me that there was like this massive operation <laughs> behind it. And that um, there were agents involved and editors and marketers and publicists and designers and all of this massive, massive industry. Um, and it just hadn't clicked to me. Um, and so the first jobs that I applied to initially were actually things to do with kind of advertising or like social media positions. Um, and after I'd gone in to do a couple of interviews with companies like that, I kind of became less convinced that these were for me. So um at the time, I was really into music and I'd started like a little blog with some friends of mine at uni where we were kind of reviewing albums or kind of going to gigs and talking about them. And um, that started to get a bit of traction online and um, a couple of smaller magazines kind of got in touch with me and asked them, uh, asked me to write for them, which was like a really lovely feeling that actually, oh, there is something here. And I was doing that for about half a year when I stumbled upon uh, an organization called Creative Access, who are this incredible organization that um, basically try and help uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds to get into the arts. So whether that's kind of theater, TV, radio, uh, all the books industry as well. Um, and they list basically a lot of training opportunities, a lot of internships and things like that. And as I was kind of scrolling through, I saw a position that was listed with a publisher called Granter. Um, I thought to myself, oh, um, I've actually heard of those guys. Um, I'd, and I read a couple of books by them um, at the time. So I figured, OK, I'll just apply and see what happens. Um, I didn't really expect to get an interview. Um, and then about a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call asking uh, me to come down from Manchester to London um, to interview. And I was like, oh, God, I don't even know anyone in London. Uh, I had to like um, go and couch surf with a friend of a friend. And I walked in and they interviewed me. And that one of the books they published recently was about um, the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, and Grants are known for quite um, literary and quite experimental. They're quite indie vibes. Um, and I went in all guns blazing talking about this book about the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, which I don't think they were expecting, um, but they were really nice about it. And somehow I ended up with a six month traineeship off the back of it, which I was really, really grateful to have. And it was a really perfect place to start because it was a slightly smaller company, it meant that I kind of uh, got to know everyone in the company really quickly. I was working primarily in the editorial department, so kind of doing submissions and writing the copy and things like that. But part of the traineeship was also that I'd spent time in every other department within the company. So I spent a bit of time publicity and kind of learning about how they got in touch with journalists to try and get reviews in newspapers or set up events at bookshops and things like that. 
Um, and I had a couple of uh, weeks in marketing as well, where they kind of taught me about kind of their relationship with booksellers and how they talk to book blogs and things like that and set up things like that. Uh, and the rights team and the sales team, like others mentioned. So it was a really great way to get kind of a cross section of what a publishing house looks like. And I think it clarified for me personally that, oh, I really want to work with the text. I really like the editorial department in particular. Um, so after that six month traineeship ended and after I begged for them to keep me uh, and they said that they didn't have space, I was like, OK. Um, so I was back basically just applying for jobs and I was applying for kind of uh, a lot of different jobs, actually. So there were like editorial assistant jobs that I applied to, but I also applied to kind of publicity assistant and marketing assistants and all these other departments that make a publishing house. And, you know, I had a few interviews, got rejected quite a few times. And then um, eventually after a couple of months, uh, there was a position at Faber and Faber where I'm currently at. Um, that was basically a cross between their general nonfiction being an assistant for their general nonfiction list and their music and pop culture list, which obviously really appealed to me, um, given that I'd been doing those kind of gig reviews and album reviews in the past. Um, so I interviewed for Faber and I landed a role with them and I was an assistant to two editors here um, for uh, about two and a half years before being promoted to my current position um, as commissioning editor. So yeah, that's my story. Thank you. Uh, let's have another editor before we go back to the world of agenting. Uh, ben, how about you? Sure. Well, I slightly sort of exemplify um, what Soleil was saying about how you can kind of jump around. So I've had a, I have had quite a, quite a varied path to where I am now. So um, uh, like several of the others, I didn't leave university thinking necessarily that I wanted to do publishing. I wanted to be an actor which was a terrible idea, but uh, I know that now, I didn't then. Uh, so I moved to London and, um, and thought, I know, I need to save up some money. I'll get a job in publishing. That was uh, an, another example of how, uh, how unaware I was at that time. So I started off um, uh, just uh, kind of just as a, a temporary editor of assistant um, for an illustrated reference publisher, where I was sort of, I was kind of doing a lot of low level admin uh, for lots of people, but also helping out on a, a real range of books. There'd be books on wallpaper, books on organic gardening, um, all sorts of stuff. And I was there fairly briefly because the company then got into all sorts of trouble and lots of people got laid off. Um, uh, but uh, I moved on to a, to another company because someone I'd worked with had gone on ahead. Um, but what I was doing there was something very different to, to books. I was working, that company um, published Partwork magazines, uh, which are these collections you usually see advertised on the telly in sort of January, Build the Titanic in 100 parts, part 199p, regular price 1099, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and so I did um, a, a stint there on all sorts of magazines. And those editorial there was you were expected to be very generalist because you would be moving from one thing to another. So I started off uh, on a power called At Home With Your PC, which was sort of teaching people computer skills. Um, I was an editor for a long while on the Agatha Christie collection, which was uh, a book and magazine collection. Uh, I edited Hong Kong Legends, which was a magazine about the Hong Kong cinema industry uh, and uh, World War II, all this sort of stuff. And then that company that I was working for branched out into a completely new um, bit of business for them, which was book packaging, which is um, another sort of part of the, the whole sort of book industry ecosystem. And so what we did there was we came up with ideas for children's book series. So this was when I first got into children's um, uh, and it was particularly serious fiction for younger readers um, uh, very big in the market then were, was a series called Rainbow Magic, which was uh, all about fairies. And, and that was another company had done that and, and had a huge success with it. So we were looking to sort of get a piece of that pie. Um, and I immediately clicked with working in children's. Uh, it was just like a light bulb and that was wonderful. Um, but what was really fascinating about that role there for me was it was kind of half and half editorial and agent, if you like, because in-house I was working on ideas for these books, finding writers, editing their work and sort of polishing it all up to send out to publishers. But then sending it out to publishers was also my job. So then I had that outward facing job like an agent going out, meeting publishers, pitching these books. Um, uh, and it was a really, really interesting way at that point to, to step into the children's industry, which was a different bit that I'd worked before. And 
it meant that I met a lot of people very fast, which is wonderful. That's sort of, I think, probably the agents will be able to speak that better to to that better than I can. But obviously, um, in that role, you you can you can expand your network really quickly and meet lots of interesting, very cool, um, and intelligent, brilliant people in the in the business. Um, and so I did that for a while, and then uh, I thought I was quite interested in seeing what happened after I had sold the books to the publisher. So I I left um, Hot House, which was the business that I was with there, and and went over and took a, um, a maternity leave cover contract uh, at a children's publisher, one of the ones that I knew quite well from having sold books to them, um, and um, and started being a, a publishing editor. Uh, and that's where I sort of the latest sort of phase of my career started. And that was, gosh, that was probably 15 years ago now. Um, but from then on, I sort of moved from publisher to publisher for a bit until I settled um, where I am now. Um, so very much a kind of like you, the, the, all my jobs have been kind of editorial based with sometimes with this agenting slant. But in terms of what your what subjects you're focused on, what companies you're working for, what size of business a huge variety um and so um as Soleil was saying it's just kind of like you don't get you don't have to you don't have to know what you're what you want now and you won't necessarily get stuck if you make a decision about where you start it's always just a starting point yeah let's go back to Soleil so we can hear a bit more about agenting and how you got to where you are um so quite similarly to Julia I when I first started looking at what I wanted to do I didn't have an idea of being an agent I just knew that I wanted to work with books and I wanted to work in an office and that was pretty much it um I loved Wattpad and I really really loved kind of creating the hype around a story on Wattpad it was always so fun so I was convinced I wanted to work in marketing I did a couple of internships um and work experience placements in marketing and I didn't find them as interesting as I'd hoped. And then I was signed up to Arts Emergency, which is uh, a, a kind of in the same sort of area as Creative Access uh, that Mo mentioned. It's a arts and mentoring charity, which I should be talking about far more knowledgeably because I am a trustee on their board. Um, but I, I I was a mentee first. And so they paired me with Rennie Edo Lodge, who's the author of Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. At that point, she was, on her final draft of the book, it was going to be published by Bloomsbury, but it was um, it hadn't finished been finished yet. So she just turned a draft into a publisher when we first started talking, and she was mentoring me. And one of the things I was saying to her is that you know I I want to work in books, I want to work in an office and have a steady, stable kind of nine to five job um, and career progression that feels quite steady. But I'm not everything I'm hearing from people who work in publishing houses where I've interned doesn't sound like it, I'm going to get that because I also uh, you know I was living independently from 16 so I was needing to have money to support myself and I was kind of looking at publishing careers going oh I don't know if I'm going to have enough money to support myself and it's definitely something you might hear a lot about the book industry but it doesn't pay very well in some cases and so that I was just super concerned about that. I was also applying for university. Um, my university year, not to pinpoint exactly how old I am, was the first year that fees raised to £9,000 a year. So I was really aware of money um, at, at that point in, in my life. And so I said this to Rennie and she said to me, well, you know, why don't you at least try? You're going to go to university and you're going to have three years to, to sort of, you're, you're in this, going to be in this course for three years, whatever it is you choose to do, and you're going to have all that time to explore. So I tried to do one sort of placement or internship a year in a different part of the book industry while I was studying. And I happened across this internship um, at the literary agency and I, you know, had no idea what they did. I went in. And one of the agents who now runs her own company, she was part of a sort of bigger company, she runs her own one, told me all about what she does. And she represented at the time Jenny Colgan, who I was obsessed with her books, like obsessed. And I was reading one at the desk one day and she came into the office and I just, I like kind of froze. I'm so starstruck. And it was in that like that moment I was like oh this is what I want to do I want to 
be able to meet people who I think are really cool, read their work before anyone else gets to, um, help them, you know, work things out that they can't quite, if it's a difficult plot point, if it is something in their book marketing, I want to be across all of it, not just one part of it. So I wrote myself a letter at that point. Um, and when I sent it to print, I went and got it. And there was a, this is back when pay slips were done like in check, so they were physical. Somebody's pay slip with their bonus was on the printer. And I should not have seen that. I absolutely should not have seen that. I won't say who it was or how much it was, but it was enough for me to not worry about making money in books anymore. So I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to have a paycheck that looks like that in the future. So I, I mean, I left university and I got my first job. It wasn't in agenting at all. It was for the Publishers Association, who are one of the people putting these events together. And I was there for just over a year. Then a job came up at Curtis Brown, which is a huge literary and talent agency. So I spent about two weeks crafting my application for that job. I was obsessed. I was like, I'm going to get this job. And then I did. Um, I was there for 18 months. And then I was pregnant and that was a surprise and the reason why I'm saying this is because at that point I was convinced I was too young to have a baby I was not married I was not ready my career was going to be over and I was going to just go live in a bin and I didn't go live in a bin my career was not over I was on maternity leave for six months which to be fair was like living in a bin but then when I came back to work I got headhunted for another company it was a boutique literary agency that was just expanding and taking on new people and had really ambitious outlook which was in line with exactly what I wanted to do so I skipped the sort of associate agent gray space between being an assistant and an agent and I left my job at Curtis Brown and went to be an agent for this literary agency where I was for two years and in those two years I built up a list which I'm really proud of that I mentioned at the beginning. I think I've said list without explaining what it is. It's a group of authors that I represent that all agents uh, will refer to their list at some stage. And it is just um, a group of authors or clients, talent, content creators, whatever the types of people you represent to do books. Um, And the group of people that I came to represent in those two years have written books I wish I had when I was younger of written books that they themselves didn't even know they would write or be capable of writing. And when I got headhunted again into the agency I'm at now, Andrew Namberg Associates, um, my now boss, said to me that she wants somebody who is going to sort of take things we already know and things we already read about and do them in a slightly different way, which is exactly what I was doing. And all of my lists, from my previous job came with me, which doesn't always happen when an agent changes agencies, but they all wanted to move with me. And that was just a really clear sign to me that I'm doing the right thing. And like, this is what I want to do. And I, I say all of that to say that my path to agency was quite linear, quite traditional, because I happened to find the path I wanted to follow quite early. Um, but it it was just, I think all of the different elements of my career came together to mean that I could be in this position now, including what I thought was going to be a side step or a kind of time when I'd have to leave the industry or stop working altogether. So, um, yeah, that's, that's me. And that's how I came to be in this role. Thank you so much. And finally, Marae, tell us your, your story. Did you always want to be an editor? Um, no, actually, kind of similarly to Mo, um, I did quite a rogue degree. Um, I did uh, languages um, and I studied French, Spanish and Italian, hoping to be a fashion buyer. Um, and then I just failed all of the number tests because I'm terrible at maths. Um, and then I had to pivot. So I just thought about things that I'd always liked to liked doing and enjoyed. And that was reading. Um, and very fortunately at the time my sister's best friend was working as a temp at penguin random house and this was pre like gdpr and she told me that there was just a website which had every editor's emails on it so i just got this website and emailed every single editor 
Um, and one responded to me and asked if I wanted to come in and do work experience. And this was at the time where work experience was unpaid, um, but it was two weeks and I had my travel reimbursed and I'm from London. So I was fortunate enough to have my parents to stay at. Um, so I did two weeks at Penguin Random House Children's um, and I really loved it. I loved working in the editorial environment and I knew that that was an environment I wanted to be in and a, and a career path I wanted to pursue. So um, yeah, I did that two week work experience after doing my year abroad. And then I went back to university and just did everything I could. I volunteered at book festivals. I worked for free um, at like a tech publishers whilst doing my job and other things. Um, and I just kind of tried to get as much experience as I could in terms of writing and um, yeah, anything else I could that, that would um, kind of, yeah, put me in good stead for applying for publishing jobs. Um, and then similarly to Mo, um, I went through a traineeship, which was aimed at bringing in um, ethnic minorities into publishing. Um, that was with something called Rare Recruitment. So they essentially hired me on behalf of Hachette, which is like a major publisher. And I did six months in marketing in Hodder Education, which was like an education publisher. And then six months at Trapeze in their editorial team, which was fiction and nonfiction. And I really liked nonfiction. Um, so I decided that would be a good path for me to pursue. Um, so I just applied nonstop for jobs after that. And I got a job as an editorial assistant um, at another publisher within Hachette. Worked there for a year supporting three um, editorial directors and publishers. So again, doing the admin side, but also doing some of the creative stuff as well. Um, and then I moved on to Square Peg, which is a really small imprint at Penguin, um, where I worked as an assistant editor. Um, and my trajectory was quite um, what I guess would be non-traditional in that when I joined, it was myself and what, just one other person, my editorial director, um, who resigned about three months into me joining. And then we went into the globe, like a global pandemic, which meant that um, companies had hiring freezes. So I like, entered the pandemic without a manager and myself on an imprint. And so um, with two other people in the wider publisher um, supervising me, I essentially took on my director's role in terms of commissioning books and trying to just learn on the job. Um, and I did that for around two years and was promoted like to editor, then commissioning editor. Um, and then I was approached by Carol, who heads up Bluebird Books um, in 2022. I mean, 20, no, I've got my years wrong in 2021. <laughs> who then asked if I wanted to join Bluebird as an editorial director, kind of working alongside her and the other commissioners on um, building the list and kind of working towards the strategy. And so that's kind of been my weird trajectory into editing. But yeah, it wasn't initially what I expected to do. Um, and yeah, quite similar to what Mo was saying, like I had other interests, so I kind of was doing them on the side um, in terms of things like music journalism and freelance writing. Um, but but strangely, those things have very much, um, I guess, informed and helped me in terms of my role, but just provided something different. Thank you. So um, we have had so many good chats uh, that I have not got through as many of my questions as I thought I would. So I'm going to ask one last question. And if you could answer as concisely as possible, it would be very appreciated. But the question is, what does a typical day look like for you? Or if there is no typical day, tell me about a recent day of work that you've done. Uh, Marie, while we have you, why don't you begin? Yeah, um, so I mean, a typical day is kind of like flailing. Um, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of um, kind of troubleshooting. The way I kind of describe the day in the life of an editor is the day in the life of a project manager, if anyone has any idea of what that looks like. But a project manager for like multiple projects at a time. So my day can kind of start off with team meetings where we give updates on upcoming titles or upcoming um, communications campaigns that might be kicking off um, or meetings where I might have to pitch a book. So a lot of meetings um, around things like that. I'll also often be meeting agents or meeting authors or having calls with authors on the editorial process and any other things like that. Um, Aside from that, I can be doing a fair bit of admin, um, even though we do have an editorial assistant who handles a lot of the admin, 
a lot of the admin you just end up doing yourself. So I might be processing contracts or I might be paying invoices or I might be taking on a new supplier, like a, a copy editor or a proofreader or a designer. Um, so it's kind of a mix of like admin, project management and creativity in terms of like editing um, and working on things like the design of a book or the cover copy on a book. That's kind of what my day looks like. Juliet, would you like to give us a day in the life of an agent? Uh, so there's all kinds of things, but I'll give you an, an idea of what I've done today. Um, so I've had a Zoom where I've met a new publisher, chatted to the editors there, pitched my book, seen where we've kind of crossed over in terms of our tastes. So there's lots of listening and talking and networking. Um, so listening to what they're looking for and trying to match up your authors and then submitting the books, perhaps. Um, I've been checking in on book festival dates. One of my authors who's kind of talking about a tour that's coming along with publication of her book in April and kind of chatting to the publisher about what she's got lined up for that. Um, I've been talking to my colleagues about an Italian offer for one of my romantic fiction authors and that's just come in from her publisher there. Um, I am also doing an introductory call with a producer in a bit to kind of pitch uh, one of my authors to her for film. Um, I've been editing a Turkish Cypriot cookbook proposal. Um, so some amazing food in there, a second book from one of my authors, Meliz. Um, I've been planning, I do, because I'm a director at the agency, we do a bit of strategy and HR. So you get these kind of curveballs chucked into your day when someone decides they want to leave or want to do something else in their role. So there's a bit of HR in my job as well. Um, I have just had an email from an author who I had to kind of edit his book on the page, his novel, because he has um, mental health issues and can't do track changes. And so I've been editing his book on paper with a red pen, which I quite like actually, it feels quite old school, but I like it. Um, and he's just sent me some notes because my writing can be terrible sometimes. And he's asking what the hell I've written next to uh, one of his paragraphs. And uh, potentially I put too many commas in for him. So he's also pushing back against that as well. Yeah, I think that's more or less it. Thank you. So I'm actually going to ask one question each to Mo, Ben and Soleil, um, just so that we get through some more questions, get a wider variety of chat. Um, Mo, what skills would you say have especially helped you in your work? Uh, I think like communication, because I think as, as everyone said, you know, especially with editing, I think some people have this view that you're kind of hunched over a desk, like doing editing by candlelight, and it's just you and your manuscript, and you're like getting really into it. But it's actually a really collaborative process with so many other people, whether that's within the book industry or kind of outside the book industry as well. I think even just kind of going off the last four or five years, the way I talk about books themselves has gotten way better, or if I'm trying to kind of strategize with other people, I think I've improved a lot there. And I think that's definitely been kind of a key thing uh, for me. Um, and other than that, I think some of the ones, I guess, keeping calm under pressure. I used to be quite an anxious person, I think, and realizing when not everything is your fault, basically. I always used to think that like when something was going wrong, oh my God, it's my fault. I've done this, I have to take the blame. And I was also really bad at taking credit for things as well. So when things happened, I was like, oh, you know, it was a, it was a team effort and uh, I did a really small part. And I think realizing that actually the work that you do is really important and it is fulfilling for you. And I think actually telling yourself that once in a while really goes a long way. Um, and as does kind of knowing when to give yourself a break, um, which is something I definitely need to get better at. But yeah, through Thank very quick. you. Thank you so much. Um, ben, you are now in a more senior role in your work. What skills do you look for when you're hiring new staff for your team? That's a good question. Um, I think for us, it's really interesting because often when we are hiring new members of the team, obviously they are quite, they can be quite close to our, to our, our target readership um in a lot of cases so for for children's um we will often we be really interested in in kind of like where i guess where a a candidate is 
finding their books? Are they finding them sort of through traditional channels, um, going into bookshops? Are they finding them increasingly as we see on TikTok or other social media? Um, and how they how they engage about that, how they how they sort of are, are tapped into that community. Um, which is not to say that you have to be sort of like a massively active book talker to get a job in children's publishing, but it's really interesting where we see that becoming such a huge driving factor um, in the market at the moment. Um, if if you if you are someone who is all over the enemies to lovers trope and following all the all the hashtags and uh, and what have you and showing that that kind of engagement with the, the the community that you would be serving if you were editing if you were part of the team I think that's something that at the moment is quite interesting. Thank you. And finally, Soleil, um, what advice would you give to young people who are looking to work as in your experience, a literary agent or an editor, but just, yeah, what would be your your top tips? My my main tip is to remember that you will be an assistant first. So whatever you go on to do, editor, agent, manager, salesperson, you are going to be an assistant first. And you're probably going to be an assistant for a year or two before you are able to do any of the more senior fun stuff. So you need to get good at admin. You need to, if you have any sort of ego in any way of thinking any job is beneath you, you need to get rid of that because you're going to have to do a lot of things which are a bit menial and arduous um, and boring before you get to edit a whole manuscript or position a book or write a pitch letter um, you're probably going to have to provide a lot of backroom support to someone who is doing those things. So try to see it as a learning opportunity. Um, publishing and the rest of the book industry don't really have um, a lot of practical courses and things that you can do before you get your job. So see the first year or two years of your career as an apprenticeship or a learning opportunity. So you want to absorb as much as you can um, during that time, but do remember that it, you, you're you not going to jump into becoming an editor or an agent. You're going to have to learn how to do it first. And a lot of that learning will take place while you are organizing spreadsheets and responding to emails and arranging diary invites and things like that. Um, my second bit of advice or a tip would be not just to read but to uh, similar to what ben said really be aware of the marketplace what are other people reading you might not particularly like romance or historical fiction um you might not be into book talk books but why are people obsessed with colleen hoover why are people who aren't on a diet buying the pinch of non books there's lots and lots of things that you could be aware of um I used to always look at the big tube adverts. I'd always get on the Victoria line to go wherever I was going. And I'd always take note of what book had the sort of biggest advert and look it up and it, why did that book have so much advertising? What, was it hugely successful? Was it brand new? Was it published by someone who just had a lot of money to throw at the campaign? And being able to have those, those things in mind will help you, not just the interviews, but for the rest of your career. Thank you so much. You have all given such amazing wisdom. I have no doubt that this was useful, um, but that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much to our brilliant panelists for giving us such great insight into working as an editor or a literary agent. Um, if you'd like to find out more about careers in the book industry, please do check out more of the Open Books online events and videos on the website, which is publishers.org.uk forward slash open books or just search for open books. Thank you so much for joining us.